Good morning to everybody in Australia and good evening to everybody in Canada who is able to join us for today's session. I think it's going to be a particularly special one. Uh, I'd like to welcome on behalf of KCOR Julian Cribb, um, just a prolific writer, uh, been around for a very long time, incredibly impressive resume, which you can find on the internet fairly easily. Uh, I could never do him justice. He's going to go through what he believes to be our existential crisis today and uh, try to explain how we got here and perhaps some of uh, how we might get out of it. So Julian, over to you. Yes, good morning or good evening, wherever you may be. Um, ladies and gentlemen, quarter of a century ago, as a science writer, I began meeting a lot of rather depressed scientists. Every day they would go into work and they would grapple with data, showing them that the earth was falling apart. Species were vanishing at accelerating rates, poisons were spreading unchecked, the climate was becoming more violent, the oceans fouled and lifeless, and vital resources like soil, water, fish, large animals and forests were disappearing. The scientists were soon joined by concerned grandparents, people like us perhaps. Then the grandparents were joined by a multitude of millennials and young people, and finally by many educated people of all ages and backgrounds. Many of these were fearful that we are in the end game of human history. Now, as a journalist, I didn't know whether that was right or wrong, but I knew that I could find out by studying the world's best science from the finest institutions and the leading minds. The result was a book, Surviving the 21st Century, which concluded that humanity faces an existential crisis consisting of 10 interconnected mega threats, all bearing down on us at the same time. Now, these threats cannot be solved one by one, as solving one threat generally only makes other threats worse. They must all be solved together at the same time using cross-cutting solutions that make none of them worse. Uh, these are the findings that basically informed the establishment of the Council for the Human Future. Basically, we want people to know about these threats, to understand them, and to work on the solutions to them together. I'm going to talk about both the threats and the solutions today. First of all, as you're well aware, we've wiped out two thirds of the uh, large animals in the world. Um, this is not just species. This is we're not wiped out two thirds of species. We've wiped out two thirds of the actual animals themselves, uh, and it's happened since 1970. So it's happened very, very fast indeed. Extinction rates are rated as being a, a, a thousand to ten thousand times above background. Um, I saw one uh, paper recently that, that said the current extinction rate is around three times faster than the one that took out the dinosaurs. Think about that for a moment. Um, basically, the, the, the point that a lot of people don't seem to get is that ecological collapse threatens human existence as well as wildlife. You know, this is not just a matter of nature. It's, it's a matter of you know, absolutely everything on the planet uh, larger than a microbe. As E.O. Wilson, the late E.O. Wilson, perhaps the world's finest biologist for a long time, says we are tearing down the biosphere. I don't think the world can sustain that. Okay, hothouse earth, we all know about that. Now, again, the, the data from the last week or so shows that climate emissions are currently rising faster and faster, and that we are already outside the worst case scenario which is the one that leads to four to five degrees heating by 2100. Um, so basically, you know, we're not in a good place there. They may come under control, but there's no sign of it yet. Um, current emissions are about 36 billion tonnes a year. Um, current uh, carbon content of the atmosphere, around about 418 to 420 parts per million, goes up and down a bit. Um, the point uh, made by NASA is that Earth is now trapping twice the heat. Uh, you know, that, that, that it was before. Um, so really, you know, we're, 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 we're really stoking the furnace at the moment. We know that polar melting and, and sea level rise are, uh, are proceeding much faster than expected by scientists. 
Um, so there's obviously a lot of feedback and drivers happening. We know there's 5 trillion tonnes, up to 5 trillion tonnes of methane buried in the Canadian Arctic, the, uh, the Arctic Oceans, um, the, the peat swamps of the world and the jungles. Uh, and a lot of that appears to be re-entering the atmosphere, along with a lot of other unexplained methane, which the scientists are scratching their head over at the moment. But methane, as you probably know, um, is, it, it drives a climate 20 times faster than, than does carbon dioxide, although its residence time in the atmosphere is not so long. So if you start your car today, the CO2 you emit will still be warming the planet in 500 years. Um, if you emit methane, uh, you know, from your leaving your, your, your barbecue gas bottle leaking, uh, it'll probably be gone in 20 or 30 years. But in the meantime, it will have done a heck of a lot of damage. So it's those little bubbles in the bottom corner that we, we really need to worry about because this is pushing the earth into a phase where the feedbacks are now warming the planet. It's not just humans are warming the planet, the feedbacks are adding to the heat. So the clearing of forests, for example, um, you know, to the, the, the conversion of the Amazon rainforest and the northern boreal forests from carbon absorbers to carbon emitters is accelerating the whole process of global warming. And this is what most people don't think. Most people still think that humans have got some control over this jalopy. They haven't. Um, it's getting out of our control very fast. OK, now this is the one that, that really gets me. Um, you know, think about all those carbon emissions. Well, we produce five times the volume of chemical emissions. Uh, that's not just chemicals that we manufacture. It's the chemicals we also emit in the process of growing our food and, and uh, you know, making things and, uh, you know, the, the pollution that we spew out left, right and centre. Um, the, the mining spoil and waste that comes with every, every mining operation and so forth. Around about, according to my estimate, 220 billion tonnes of human chemical emissions. And those are affecting all life on the planet that is you know, in contact with them. Um, there have been various estimates over how many actual chemicals humans manufacture. Uh, it, it started off around about 70 or 80,000. It's now up to 350,000 and counting. And there is no inventory. There is no worldwide chemical inventory. So to be honest with you, we just don't know. We don't know what is being produced in China, in Russia, or even the United States. A lot of it's secret. Um, and it's being produced willy-nilly, and there are very few checks to see whether any of these chemicals are safe for humans or safe for the environment. Uh, now, the bit that gets me here is that chemical deaths, that is environmental deaths, as they, they are euphemistically termed by the World Health Organization, are now running at 13.7 million people a year. That's people dying mainly from the effects of chemicals which we know is air pollution, indoor air pollution, outdoor air pollution, um, you know, the, the chemicals in your food chain, the, the chemicals in your wa the water you drink, and so forth. But chemical exposure is so massive, it is killing twice as many people a year as World War II. Think about that for a moment. This is the worst case, the worst preventable case of mass manslaughter in human history. And you know it's it's taking place outside out of mind. Um, governments don't seem to care about it. You know the the efforts to to rein it back are, are you know pathetic, um, and it's starting to affect all of us. Now, you, you may have wondered you know how come America came to elect Donald Trump or Australia to elect um, Morrison? <laughs> well, the answer is the human IQ damaged by all the nerve poisons, the neurotoxins that are being emitted has been going down steadily since 1975. We've lost about 13 points, okay, which reduces the average human being to the intellectual level of the average jail inmate. Think about that for a moment. So, you know, people are just not as smart as they used to be. Uh, we can see we're losing around about three points per decade. Um, and, you know, this is, this is really alarming, but it's part of the the array of brain poisons that are affecting human beings. I, I could give a whole separate talk on this. Um, but basically, it may be one of the explanations why people are very slow on the uptake uh, when it comes to acknowledging these huge threats and the need for action about them. So brain diseases, and by that I include autism, ADHD, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, depression, and so on, are pandemic. I mean, depression alone hits 
is 400 million people a year. Roughly a quarter of the human population is suffering from one kind of brain disorder or another. Okay, now think of all the nursing that's required to look after the people who are disabled by these brain diseases. And you start to see the scale of the problem. Now we're gonna have half the workforce looking after people who are brain damaged within 50 years. So, you know, there's not gonna be much productivity going on. So, you know, we've got to get on top of this chemical one. It is five times larger and 10 times more deadly than climate change at the moment. Right, think about the resources that you and I use. Um, I mean, the bottom line is that we use about a hundred billion tons of the earth's resources every single year now, you know, and it, it's absolutely colossal. I mean, each of us over a lifetime consumes enough fresh water to float a decent sized aircraft carrier or a battleship. Think about that, you know. Um, obviously we're, we're plowing through our forests, we're going through our grasslands, we're, we're, we've got massive soil loss over which we have absolutely no control, no matter what is claimed. Uh, you know, so these are the big ones, but of course we're also motoring through various kinds of minerals and, and energy form and things like that. We're starting to see the impacts in the dead zones in the ocean. When we unleash nutrients into our rivers and things like that, they poison the oceans. So there are dead zones forming uh, all the way around the populated coast, coastlines of the world. I mean, the, the big one is the, the one at the mouth of the Mississippi, um, but they're all over the place, you know, and they are a product of human soil disturbance and fertilizers used in agriculture. Um, and, and, you know, they are unleashing the stagnant ocean phenomenon, which is, you know, what happened way back when only my, um, microbial life could survive on planet Earth. So we're creating that dead ocean that, that existed more than 700 million years ago. Uh, we, we need to think about this. I mean, that's a photograph that I took in the, in the Andes in Chile. Uh, that's a, that's, those are the salt lakes of the Atacama. And you can see there are two flamingos in the picture. There used to be 6,000 flamingos on that lake. The water from that lake has all been taken to process the lithium for the battery in your mobile phone or your shaver or your hedge trimmer, whatever it is. So, you know, when we, we, we try to solve one problem, you know, carbon, carbon driven climate change by lithium driven energy systems, uh, we create other problems that we don't think about. You know, we just pretend they're not happening, uh, but they're ca catastrophic as well. So we, we, we really need to start thinking about this resources problem because we are running out of resources. We use the entire Earth's sustainable budget of resources by July every year. We, we now need 1.75 planets to sustain the current population at its current rates of demand. Okay, well, as, as Vladimir has kindly reminded us, um, you know, we are only 100 seconds from midnight. Um, basically, you know, nuclear war is an unpredictable thing. It can happen at any time. It is evident, um, certainly according to the Chicago group, that a lot of countries, um, you know, Russia, America, China, perhaps, you know, think that using small nuclear weapons is probably okay. Well, let me tell you, as an agricultural writer, it ain't okay. Even a small nuclear war of 50 to 100 nukes would create enough global war, uh, cooling to freeze the harvests in North America, in China, you know, around the world. Basically, a small nuclear war, uh, while it might be confined to somewhere like India, Pakistan, um, or, or Russia, Ukraine, would nevertheless kill 2 billion people because they would die of starvation. So, you know, these things cannot be allowed to happen. Uh, there's a lot of scientific papers on that. Don't take my word for it, read the papers. Um, you know, Toon and Robock and people like that. Uh, so there are eight nations with the power to terminate human civilization right now. And none of them really are behaving in a responsible fashion. And the nuclear arsenal has been decreasing in number, but it has been increasing in technology and you now have nuclear robot drones. And what could possibly go wrong with that? You know, So that's the sort of question. So these deadly new weapon systems basically are, uh, you know, um, 
they're a potential menace, whether whether you deliberately used or used by accident. And we still have no universal agreement to disarm. Um, and I, there's, uh, all right, uh, half the world's nations have signed the treaty calling for the, the complete removal of all nuclear weapons, but 70 nations have refused so far to sign that. And that certainly includes Australia. I think it probably includes Canada as well. So basically our countries want a nuclear war. That's their current policy. Uh, you know, or, or the Americans have intimidated us into wanting a nuclear war. So, you know, we, we need to think very hard um, about whether we really want a nuclear war, because this is the most likely way by which the human species will be extinguished. You know, it's, it's a catastrophic famine followed by unbridled war with, with no controls and the dissolution of nations. Uh, nobody can predict how, when that's going to happen or how bad it will be, but it is an omnipresent threat for the whole of this century. Pandemics, well, there've been seven since 2000, but most people haven't noticed that. Everyone talks about COVID. What about the six others, you know? And now we've got monkeypox starting to rage through the population. Um, you've got to have pretty intimate relations with someone to get monkeypox. It's not like coughing in the supermarket, but uh, basically pandemics are whizzing around the planet at a rate of a new one every single Every, every two to three years, basically, we're seeing a new pandemic arising. Many of them are arising from the ruined rainforests where the viruses that are present in the endemic species, the animals and the birds that live in the rainforest, because all the animals and birds are being destroyed, the viruses have to go somewhere and they say, oh, we'll, we'll use these uh, not so intelligent monkeys. You know, there's, there's plenty of them around, <laughs> we'll infect them. So, you know, that's why they're transferring to us because we're the nearest available compost heap. Um, and, and they will continue to do so at ever increasing rates. So far, there have been 89 spillovers, that is transfers of wild animal viruses into humans. So it's not just COVID and it's not just HIV, you know, it, it's, you know, all the hantaviruses um, or Marburg or Ebola, uh, 89 of them. Fortunately, most of them were, were, were not uh, terribly harmful. Um, maybe didn't even make us sick at all. But that gives you some idea of the rate at which these things are spilling out of the wild world that we're ruining. What is the cause of pandemics? Well, the short answer is it's caused by overpopulation. Too many people, too close together, and traveling too much. You know, I mean, basically, pandemics are caused not by disease, but by behavior right? It's human behavior that spreads disease. And currently, our behaviors, the things we expect to do, like tourism um, and megacities, you know, are absolutely ripe for pandemics. So we're going to see a lot more of them. And the WHO warns they're going to be worse, too. The other thing we've got to worry about is, are we actually constructing some of these things for ourselves? There is pretty good evidence that humans are inadvertently not, not deliberately, well, they may be deliberately, uh, manufacturing new forms of life that are highly infectious to humans. So we should stamp on that. We're, it's not regulated at the moment. There is no control over the kind of research that was being done uh, at, at North Carolina University or the Wuhan Institute. There is no control at all uh, uh, over that type of research. Uh, and, and the bloody well should be. So we, we, we need to start you know getting our game together here we are not in a position to prevent future pandemics okay well look behind all of these behind all of these is population i mean everything has got so much more dangerous since the mid 60s since the green revolution ignited the human population boom the green revolution plus vaccines plus penicillin those were the three um that's what took us from 2 billion or around 2 billion when i was born to the current nearly 8 billion, um, we are still experiencing record rates of growth because although the fertility rates are starting to come down uh, and women worldwide are saying, we don't want so many babies or any babies at all, in fact, uh, but nevertheless, there are more women on the planet and therefore there are more babies. But don't just, let's not just blame the babies and their parents. Let us blame the old folks like myself who insist on living too long, you know, um, basically human population growth is, is driven nearly 50-50 by
by babies and by old folks living longer. Um, it, uh, somebody living in, in uh, Australia or Canada eats 35,000 more meals than somebody living in West Africa because of a extended life expectancy. Fortunately, we're starting to see human life expectancy starting to come down in countries like America, United States, uh, but it's gonna be very slow. Um, depends how quickly the American health system falls apart, I guess, but it, it, you know, it is starting to go and we're starting to see antibiotic resistance and other factors um, that, that uh, will influence this. However, you know, the good news is the human population is on track to peak in the late 2060s. At this, at current rates of, of, of increase, it'll peak out around about then. And that's a fairly magic moment, but it's going to take another 100 to 200 years to actually decline to a level that the earth can carry. Think about that for a moment. The, the scientific estimates that I have read are that we basically can sustain a population of between two and 2.5 billion, that is the population of 1950, at our current rates of resource use. So that's the target. That's what the target has to be. And we've got to get over this business of don't mention the population. You know, it, it, this, is, this is absolutely lunacy. I, I, I know that there are various economic sectors who are heavily invested in, in, in people overpopulating the planet, the real estate business, and for example. Um, but, you know, let's not, let's not be deluded by these people. You know, they're, they're, they're leading us to disaster. It is population that is driving all of the other mega threats. Food insecurity. Well, we've, we've had a touch of this. We've had several touches of it, actually. First, first we had a, a big wake up call in 2008. Um, and there have been a number of smaller ones since then. And there's been a much bigger one uh, with the Ukraine war and, and the major um, climatic disruption that's taken place in the last two years. So these climatic disruptions are really starting to snowball. As I mentioned, we're running out of fresh water, big time, big time. There are countries like India, Pakistan, China, uh, the Middle East, which are critically short of water and they cannot afford to use any of their scarce water to grow food any longer. So they really are on the horns of a dilemma in those countries. That's why China is buying up farms all around the world, because they know they cannot grow the food they need within China itself. That's why they're buying farms in Chile, in the Philippines, in New Zealand, in Australia, probably in Canada for all I know, um, certainly in Africa. Um, they're aware of the problem. They've been aware of the problem a long, long time. Uh, you know, I've spoken to their Academy of Sciences back in the 1980s, 1990s, and they told me they knew that they were overpopulated back then and couldn't feed them all. So, you know, uh, they're doing something about it. The Middle East is doing absolutely bugger all about it. They're going to 600 million people and they don't have the capacity to feed them. Uh, so their answer is to go and buy land in Africa. Take land and Africa is going to 4 billion people. So that's not a solution, is it? Um, India and Pakistan are really on a knife edge at the moment because their water is fully used up. And New Delhi has, uh, is, is very close within two years of running out of water completely. And you know, we, we've seen other cities like that, Sao Paulo, Cape Town, and so on around the world, which are just running out of their local water supplies. And those water supplies are being subtracted from what the farmers need. That's the case in China. The, the huge cities of North China are taking the water that normally used to grow the wheat. So, you know, there is a crunch coming with food production. We can no longer feed humanity using the technology known as agriculture, which is a Bronze Age technology. It's been pretty good for the last six, 7,000 years, but it's not going to feed 10 billion people on a hot, resource-scarce planet by the 2050s. So we need a new way, completely new way, to produce food. And I'll talk about that a bit later on. Okay, technology threats. These often get terribly downplayed as people don't realize what they mean to, to our futures. So, you know, talk about artificial intelligence. You know, there are lots of downsides as well as pluses. You hear all about all the positives, but they never tell you what the downsides are. You know, one of the downsides is universal surveillance. Now, when those quantum computers come online, every single one of us 
is going to be monitored every second of our life from birth to death. You know, we get all those video cameras, which you, you know, they can't be used properly at the moment because you haven't got enough police constables to, to view the footage. You'll have them AI, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be stored in, 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 in the expanded cloud that quantum computers will create. And, and you'll have mining um, software that will, will find anybody anywhere on earth. You know, the Chinese are working on this facial recognition technology to make it perfect. Every single individual is going to be spied upon. You know, every transaction you make, every keystroke you make, every call you make on your phone, where you go, you know, your, your phone, your car, your television's listening to you, your phone's listening to you. It's, it's a frigging nightmare. Um, but let me explain why I think it's so dangerous. Because if you put people under surveillance like this, they stop talking openly and honestly about the risks and the problems that they see around them. I mean, that happened in communist Soviet Union. Um, it's probably happening in China at this moment. You know, if you police people too heavily, the, the freedom of speech is lost and the freedom to warn people about the disasters that are coming. So talks like this one would be banned in, in a future police state where, you know, where the, you know, these technologies are used against us. I've already spoken about the man-made plagues. There are severe risks here. I don't really want to go into detail here because it would take a long time. Now, nano pollution is a new chemical threat. You know, nanoparticles are so small that they are passing. Just think of the plastic that goes into the oceans. It doesn't float around as bags and, and bottles. It grinds down into ever smaller microscopic particles that end up in fish and the fish go on our tables and the particles end up in our brain. And that chain has been demonstrated by science. Every baby born in, 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 in the, the civilized world these days, the first poo it takes immediately after it comes out of the womb is chock full of plastic particles, 80,000 plastic particles in that first poo. So, you know, and that's just an example. When you, when you wash your, uh, you know, your um, microfiber jumper, it sheds 7,000 little fibers, which all go down the drain, go into the river, spread and they all get smaller and smaller and smaller until they can penetrate individual cells you know so so this is a very alarming thing nothing is being done to prevent it nothing whatsoever problem with nano pollution is once you put it out there you cannot call it back uh, i've spoken about killer robots and nuclear drones uh, we've had a, a recent demonstration of um, uh, al-qaeda um, Mega city collapse is, is an interesting one. It relates principally to food and water because no mega city on earth can feed itself. They all depend on these enormous transport chains that come from all over the planet. Uh, so if those chains get cut off by a flood, a climatic event, a war, whatever, that city starves by the end of the week, basically. It runs out of food in two or three days. We've, we've seen this happen numerous times. The supermarkets just empty. Uh, people panic by. Um, they might hang on a bit with what's in their larder, but really, basically, within a fortnight to three weeks, a city of 20 million people can be starvation, in utter starvation. Um, and that, of course, will have resonating impacts on all the surrounding area and indeed on the world economy. So we need to think about these, these big cities and, and the need to sustain them longer into the future. So these technology threats, that there is no current method of addressing all of the technology threats that we see. I mean, if you think about it, every single threat that humans face is a result of our overuse, misuse, or general, you know, or malign use of technologies. I mean, coal used to be relatively harmless in the 1850s. Look what it's done to the planet today. Um, you know, so all of these are technologies that are off the leash and uncontrolled. We need a World Technology Commission to get control of these things because they're being abused. Misinformation, wow, you know, how can you do anything about any of these problems if your population is delusional? Uh, and very large chunks of the population are delusional these days. Um, and not only that, I mean, the point is it's challenging science. So we've, we've seen the debate over vaccines and masks in the case of COVID and things like that. Um, people who know nothing 
are making big claims. So very interesting research came out of America about two days ago that showed that, that people in, in uh, red states, um, that, you know, Republican states, are much more likely to die of COVID than people in blue states. And it, it's, it's, it, it's simply a question of how much disinformation there is about, you know, safety precautions with COVID. So that's an example of how ignorance kills. Uh, and there are many, many other such examples. But we've now got this problem where the, the $7 trillion oil, coal, gas, and fossil and uh, petrochemical sector is pumping out lies. They've, they've developed these lie factories, which inundate our social media and our media, especially at election time, uh, with their propaganda designed to dis, de, derail any attempts to fix the climate and, and things like that. So they've got these lie factories, which are then taken up by you know, Rupert Murdoch, Fox News, and spread out to the, you know, the great unwashed um, and ignorant out there who haven't got the critical faculties or maybe the IQ to, uh, to analyze these things. So misinformation is now, in my view, a deadly threat to the human species. Right. If, if we continue to behave with utter stupidity and utter lack of real, realism towards these problems, then we won't fix them. You know, if we think about them seriously, we can fix them. But, you know, they're all fixable. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, disinformation is disabling our governments. You know, politicians buy into this. They, they read the talking points from the fossil fuel sector. And our own prime minister here in Australia started using coal talking points the other day you know, bullshit that the coal industry manufactures. <laughs> and, you know, that's just an example of how deep into politicians' pockets the, this, this, this evil sector now reaches. Okay, well, the good news is that there are solutions to all of these things. Um, and, and they're detailed in a forthcoming book of mine called How to Fix a Broken Planet, which I hope will be out before the end of the year. Um, they can all be fixed by worldwide action action by governments, but especially by individuals. We've got to change our behavior if we want to fix these things. Um, but, you know, absolutely first, we have to understand there is a problem. And let me tell you, at this moment, no government on earth has a policy for human survival. So this means that no government on earth acknowledges that humanity, human civilization and human survival are at risk. That is the extent of their blindness to these issues. Okay, but um, please bear in mind what I said, that all of the risks have to be solved together so that the solutions do not make other risks worse. The solutions are cross-cutting, in other words. Okay, well, banning nuclear weapons, that's easy, you know. We just keep on doing what we're doing. We've done pretty well in, in, in banning and getting rid of chemical and biological weapons. You know, they're, they're, the stockpiles there are like 98% destroyed now. Um, but we have made very little progress in eliminating uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons. And there's still, you know, a, around about 13,000 warheads, which is more than enough to, to rub out humanity um, at, at the moment. And of those 5,000 are ready to go at this moment as I speak. So, you know, it's, we're still in a terribly dangerous place with regard to nuclear weapons. We need to put all the pressure we possibly can on the countries that have these damn things to get rid of them because they're not necessary. You can have plenty of wars without going nuclear as, we, as we've so far seen in Ukraine, let's hope it stays that way. Um, we need to have uh, a surveillance system that is much more you know, rigorous than, than the, even than the one we have today. And we need to form a really strong universal citizens movement. You know, I mean, there is, you know, we've got doctors against nuclear war and there's all sorts of groups that are doing this, but it's a kind of second order issue. It doesn't even appear in the media these days very much. So, you know, but it is the biggest thing that can go wrong. You know, if humans fall out over scarce resources, over famine, over whatever, nuclear weapons will be on the table, you know, big time. Right, and fossil fuel use. Look, you know, we, we are blessed with abundant sources of clean energy, you know, where, whether it's wind or wave or uh, algae in the picture, you know, that you can 
if you squeeze algae, you get oil out of them. You can put the oil in your in your Toyota Hilux and drive away. Uh, you know, you can make a T-shirt out of algae. You can you can feed algae to fish. Um, you know, so algae are damn useful little creatures, and we we should be farming them much more than we are at the moment. So we've got all of these options. Um, one that might interest Canada, of course, is the is the hot rock geothermal uh, option. You know, I mean, the, the, there's plenty of heat in the earth. We don't need to uh, produce it by burning coal or oil. Um, so you know, all of these all of these energy options, up to nuclear fusion and things like that, uh, need to be needs to be an, an absolute crash wartime research program to get new energies up there to maintain our civilization, hopefully on a slightly declining level of energy use because it is the energy that is really destroying the planet. But the waste and the poisoning, you know, comes from industry just chucking stuff away willy-nilly, pouring it in the river, whatever it is. Now, we've got little regulations that try to stop that. But let me tell you, there is now a worldwide planetary river of pollution that is going round and round the world in the air, in the oceans, in wildlife, and in human beings themselves. But that pollution is moving constantly around the planet. You find these industrial pollutions from Russia have been found in the Antarctic. You know, so, so you know, there is no escaping this stuff. Doesn't matter how good your laws, you could have the best environmental laws in the world, and you can't stop this stuff coming in on the tide and on the wind and in imported products from, from dirty manufacturers. So we need a circular economy for the world where we recycle and reuse absolutely everything. Now, if you think about this, if population is about to peak in the 2060s, we, we don't need to open another mine ever after the 2060s. Why? Because everything that we need for, to support a declining human population is available in the waste stream. We can mine the waste streams of the world you know, the, the urban garbage tips for all the metals and materials. Uh, and, and so de developing this circular economy, and particularly for things like water, uh, it's essential, is, is really a, a critical aspect of it. If you go to a, a creative, you don't have to get rid of growth. A lot of people are saying, oh, we've got to get rid of growth. Well, we don't have to, in my view. But you, you create growth in what I call the ideas economy, the creative economy. That is the things that come out of the human mind because the human mind is inexhaustible and our ideas are inexhaustible. And you, know, you can have plenty of jobs, uh, new companies, new products, new exports. You can have lots of growth from the things of the human mind that doesn't involve material goods and pollution, right? So we need to shift the world economy from a materials-based economy to a circular economy and an ideas-based economy. So things like the arts, the sciences, entertainment, sport, all of these things have very low material requirements. Um, and, you know, they can still produce plenty of economic growth to keep people prosperous. Uh, another one, which I, again, don't have time to talk about here, but money is what's doing the damage to the world. Money is a figment of the human imagination. Doesn't exist in the real world. Ask your dog. Um, we need an earth standard currency to replace all these stupid roulette chips that we've currently got, which people are gambling with at our expense. Now, the problem that we have is that the amount of money on the planet at the moment is infinite because commercial banks and central banks can print as much of it as they like, and they just pluck it out of thin air and pump it into the economy. They pump up the economy into this great over bloated thing, you know, so they increase the number of dollars, but they don't increase the actual wealth. Uh, you know, so, so we're now in that stupid situation and we're using those dollars to cut down forests, mine the oceans, et cetera, et cetera, destroy the, the water of the planet and so on. So you cannot have infinite supply of money on a finite planet and expect to get away with it. That's the point. So we need a money, a, a currency, that is tied to the ability of the earth to support human and other life, right? That is so, so I'm proposing a currency that is based upon the composition of the atmosphere, the oceans, uh, forest cover, 
water availability and so forth. A currency that is based on real, scientifically measurable things, not on the fantasies of a bunch of bankers and speculators. Okay, so you know, a currency that is based on the real world in which we live. Renewable food, it's absolutely doable. I've been writing about food for over 50 years, and let me tell you, this is on the cards now. The renewable food revolution has three pillars. First of all, regenerative agriculture, um, represented by Joel Salatin in, in, in the top left-hand corner. So this is basically agriculture that does no damage to its surrounding environment. In fact, it repairs it. It's agriculture that's better integrated between li livestock and crops and pastures and things like that. Um, it's our agriculture that uses far less chemicals. Currently, agriculture uses around 5 million tonnes of poisons a year, and that's going into the food supply So, you know, and the environment. So, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not a good agriculture. And incidentally, it also kills about two-thirds to three-quarters of people anyway because they die of a food-related disease. So it's not a good diet either. Um, I'm talking about the, the modern Canadian and Australian diet. Um, but there are lots of ways that we can replace agriculture, old agriculture that's going to be climate wrecked and is going to lose its soil and its water. We can start producing much more food in our cities, and there are some wonderful ideas for doing that. The one in the middle is a proposal in Singapore that oh, it's a retirement village. So all these old bankers and IT people and so on become farmers in their old age. They're fit, they're healthy, they enjoy a good social life, growing food and they eat this wonderful, fresh, healthy diet. So, you know, I mean, that's a nice way to retire, I suspect, you know, nicer than some of the horrible ones we've got today. <clears throat> so the concept of taking all of the nutrients and the water that our great cities currently throw away, you know, would feed around about three to four billion people if we simply recycled them back into food using various types of urban food production, including bottom left, biocultures, where you actually brew up these new things like the, you know, the impossible burger um, or the, the meat substitutes and, and, and the milk and egg substitutes that are now rolling off the scientific production line. The third pillar, so two pillars, regenerative farming, urban food production, and the third one is deep ocean aquaculture. Coastal aquaculture is not particularly sustainable. It pollutes the local area. Uh, it's too intensive. Uh, however, if you locate it out in the ocean using an old oil rig or something like that as the, as the farm, um, you, can get, you can avoid all of those problems. You can, in a, in a cubic kilometer of ocean, you can produce a heck of a lot of fish and you don't have to cram them together like you do in a, in a net farm close to, close to shore. So, and they stay clean. You don't need to treat them with chemicals. You know, they, they, they stay unpolluted. Um, their waste gets dispersed on the ocean currents. So deep ocean aquaculture can feed a third of the human species. We've got to get onto it fast. We're just starting at the moment. It's a new technology. If you do that, basically half of the world's farmland can be turned back into forest and grassland and we can rewild it. And that's gonna soak up a heck of a lot of carbon. Right, so think about that. Half of the world's current land current used for agriculture uh, can be turned back into forest and, uh, and grassland. And who's gonna do this? Well, all the farmers who are currently being kicked off their farms by the big agribusiness chains, for starters, and all the indigenous people who want their environment back. For, so there's lots of people willing to do this where do we get the money? We take $320 billion out of the weapons budget. That's easy to do. You know, we know we can cut the weapons budget and get less war because we did it in the, in the early part of this century. So let's just take some of that wasted money, the $1.8 trillion that is currently wasted on building new weapons and turn it back into food for peace. Now, two thirds of the wars in human history began in a fight over food, land, and water. If you actually restore their productive capacity, you reduce the potential for two thirds of the wars that break out in human history. So think of all the little wars that have happened, 50 wars that have happened in Africa in, in the last half century. Most of those were arguments over rangeland or grazing land or farmland or water or something like that. 
they, they were tribal disputes. You know, they start with this fundamental row over can we feed ourselves? Can we feed our kids? And now, so just let's put let's put nature back and feed ourselves by the methods I've just described. Okay, we've talked about the chemicals one. Well, uh, I'm not going to go into all of the details here, but you can see how this integrates with the other solutions we've talked about. Um, to, to make it work, we need to clean up the Earth lives. We need agreement among all the people on Earth that we need to make the place cleaner because we're poisoning our children. Every child on the planet is being poisoned every single day, and that's a disgrace. We need a human right not to be poisoned. Okay, because that right was enjoyed by all our ancestors. Why should we be the only two or three generations to get poisoned? That's what I want to know. Get rid of fossil fuels and you will get rid of three quarters of the poisoning. Okay, so that's a really important thing. You, if you solve climate by getting rid of fossil fuels, you will solve most of this problem as well, because nearly all of the chemicals that you ingest or absorb are the product of fossil fuels or the breakdown products of fossil fuels in various ways, including when you get sick from all of this, the prescription that your doctor gives you is made from fossil fuels. Right? So the solution to dying of fossil fuels is, is medicine made from fossil fuels. Think about that. Um, you know, we need preventative health care, not that kind of you know, drug-induced nonsense that we've got at the moment. So basically, you know, a zero waste, green chemistry product stewardship, all of these techniques are perfectly achievable. Some industries are already practicing them. Um, every chemical we produce must be tested for safety. It cannot be released unless it has been tested for human safety. At the moment, 80, 90% of them are not tested at all. They're just released. And most of them are being produced in the third world these days anyway. So, you know, we've got no control over them. Now, I've talked about reducing the need to reduce the, the population. Well, women have led the way here. They cut their fertility uh, from five babies per woman down to 2.4 since the 1970s, since the 1960s. Uh, we know the scientific estimates that the Earth's carrying capacity is around about 2 to 2.5 billion at current levels of, of, uh, of living standards. Um, but it, it is possible to reduce the current 8 billion back down to 2 billion using voluntary family planning methods. But we have to make them available to everybody. And that would cost about $300 million to make family planning available to every woman on earth would cost about $300 million. It's almost nothing. Um, but at the moment, there's a lot of forces aligned against it. Political forces, religious forces, and economic forces will do all they can to stop you talking about population. You'll notice that no po politician ever mentions population. You know, they're terrified of it as a topic because they'll get bullied by, I don't know, the Catholic Church or the real estate agents or whoever it is, you know, that wants population growth. Um, so we've got to start talking about this. And the good news is as well that young people are not having babies. And many of them say they don't want babies. There was a survey done in, in Michigan um, only a couple of months ago where, where they found 40% of young people said they didn't want any kids. You know, so you, you could say, oh, they might change their minds when the, when the clock ticks, but that's a very common view nowadays. And I think it is a, a natural human instinct that is retreating from the danger of overpopulation in the same way that after World War II, we had the baby boom, which was a response to, to the death rates that had taken place. So, you know, th this is a natural response to try to curb our population. We can do it. We can do it voluntarily without putting compulsion on anybody. In China, the birth rate has come down uh, to 1.7, 1.8 at the moment. So they're well below replacement now. So the Chinese population would, will start to shrink fairly quickly soon. The Japanese population is already has already reduced itself by 12, 13%. There are 15 countries in the world that have cut their population by 10 to 15%. So there's lots of people doing it, you know, um, and if we're to avoid the tidal waves of refugees that follow the famines and, and the water crises and things like that, we've got to get that population down quick. 
So one child less, that's what you tell people, have one child less. Right? You'll, you'll, you'll cut your carbon emissions, you'll, you'll just you know, be much kinder to the earth and that child will, or the child that you do have, will have a much better life. Well, I've talked about what needs to be done to produce, to prevent future pandemics. You know, we've got to cut the human population because that's where the pandemics arise. You know, if, if you're a chicken farmer, you know very well that you throw 30,000 chicken in a large shed, they will get all sorts of disease. You pack them close together. Well, that's what humans are doing. You know, we're a big chicken farm. And, you know, <laughs> to be honest with you, the answer to, to pandemics is reduce the population, stop traveling. <laughs> And I mean, we can have the Zoom conferences like this, which are plenty of fun, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and there's a whole lot of other things. I, I won't go into details, but there's plenty that can be done to mitigate and prevent future pandemics, especially put the rainforests and the forests back, put them back and let the, the viruses stay where they, where they are. Thank you very much. Now, one I think is terribly important is we need to put women in charge. You know, women, must lead government, religion, the community, society, and especially industry, right? The coal, oil, and fossil fuels industry is led by men. It is a construct of male group think. That's why it's so incredibly damaging. Men like to solve their problems quickly using technology and you know, weapons or something like that. We like to fix things quick. We take very little account of the long, term future, the consequences of the technology. Women think about the grandchildren, right? And that's the difference. Men start wars, women don't start wars. Men are the mass producers of poisons, women are not. Women are, are the leaders today of the major world health and family organizations that are fighting the poisons, right? Women don't clear fell forests, that's blokes, you know? Men don't mind the oceans. That's blokes. You know, these are blokey things. Men need to change the way they think. It was wonderful when we were cavemen. It, it was the right way to think when we were cavemen. It was probably the right way to think when we were in the medieval period. It's not the right way to think in an overpopulated world. We need female thought, female leadership, and men who can think like women. Uh, you know, so, so basically put the girls in charge and we will have a chance of surviving what is coming down. Um, look, there are, there are, it is very urgent that we explain this issue to everybody on the planet, okay? Not just our friends and, and neighbors and, and peers. You know, this has got to get to every Chinese peasant farmer, everybody in, in Africa, you know, uh, everybody in India and so forth. But we do have the capacity now to do this. And there are ways of thinking about the planet. So a good one is this, the diagram is, which I'm sure many, many of you are familiar with because it, it goes back to um, the, the original uh, Club of Rome concept that we're running out of resources. Basically, we're butting up against boundaries to survive, to human survival in the planet. And the green area is where we're safe. The orange is where we've broken through the boundary. And the red is where we're in desperate plight. So you can see we are now busting through the habitable earth and we've got to bring that back under control before it gets us somehow we need to explain this to people we've got to live within our means because there is no other planet we need to do this together now i've mentioned no government on earth yet has a policy for human survival now that's a disgrace that is how short term these people are i mean some of them are fiddling with a climate policy but they're not making much progress because they're being paid by the fossil fuels industry not to make progress. Um, and, you know, we've, we've, had, we've witnessed 10 years of spinning our wheels on climate in Australia and more and more coal and gas being generated, you know, because the politicians have been bought. Um, we need a scientific basis, an agreement among all the peoples of the world for, for how we actually do this together, how we generate a sustainable, safe, healthy planet. And that is a, a proposal, is an Earth System Treaty. Now, the, the group Common Home of Humanity has proposed this. I'm proposing a slightly more complex one that takes account of all 10 of the mega threats. But if we had an Earth System Treaty signed and ratified by every nation on Earth, and indeed 
by every individual on earth, then I think we would have a show because at least we would have a common goal, a common objective, a common agreed need to act. And that is going to save billions, billions of lives that will otherwise be lost in the catastrophe that will unfold if we don't fix these things. So basically, that's uh, that's my talk. I'm very happy to uh, to take debate and questions and things like that. And uh, yeah, back to back to you, Dave. Great, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, just a moment. I'm going to turn my chat on and get to the top. Okay, I've. Uh, hmm. um, I've reserved the first question for myself and. Um, Zach, I'd like to know if if you still want to jump in. You're in here twice. Uh, you can raise both points if you want, although I know one of them may well have been answered. So I want to uh, pursue this idea of an Earth Systems Treaty for a moment. And I was wondering if you could tell us where you think that coordination of our effort, whether it's through that particular treaty or some other mechanism, or perhaps we, we need many mechanisms, where it should be coordinated? Well, a treaty is something that can only be co coordinated through the United Nations or a similar body. Basically, all the treaties, the law of the sea, everything like that happens at the UN level. Um, and the UN is, is far from perfect, as we all know, but it's the best we've got. And if we abandoned it, then we would really be in a big mess. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I think that that's the way. The point about that treaty is it does put a certain amount of pressure on the backsliding countries, countries like Russia, Canada, Australia, <laughs> who are backsliders on climate and, and other, you know, and environmental damage and, and things like that. So, um, you know, if, if, if you feel obliged to solve it, 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 very importantly, it sets a standard of behavior for everybody on the planet, and that includes the big corporations. We've got to bear in mind that. Okay. The world's yeah. nations are, are gradually, which they use by date, that there probably won't be any nations by the end of this century anyway, or very few of them. But we will still have corporations, and corporations are auto autocracies, and they're very bloody dangerous if they don't conform to what humans expect of them. But humans can discipline them by not buying their products <laughs> if they are damaging humans' chances of survival. So there is an economic way of, of disciplining corporations. But again, an Earth System Treaty would provide a yardstick uh, for corporate behavior. So we could, we could measure whether Exxon or, or whoever it is was behaving properly or not according to the Earth System Treaty. And uh, we, could, you know, we could punish their shareholders accordingly. Great, thank you. Okay, so I've got Zach Jacobson and then Peter McKinnon, you've made quite a number of uh, interventions and I'm gonna turn the floor over for you to have a discussion with uh, Julian about as many of them as you wanna bring up at once. So Zach, please. Hi, um, well, thanks. I truly, truly enjoyed that. Um, I have been saying for a very short while to whoever, not not probably as long as you, uh, but to anyone who will listen. Yeah, put women in charge. They are looking like the wave of the of the uh, governmental future. Uh, to name a few you probably haven't got on your list. I didn't check them all. Um, the, uh, the current governor of the state of New York, uh, who, who decided to uh, basically play whack-a-mole with the American Supreme Court. Every time they have, have a bad idea, she'll whack it, at least for New York State. And that's a, basically the third largest country that falls among the United States of America. Um, that's all I was going to say. Uh, uh, thank you for saying that. And um, I wait to hear what Peter is going to say. He's always interesting. So Julian, if you have a quick response, go ahead, and then we'll go to Peter. I'll tell you where I came across the, the, the insight. The first book I wrote about the chemical pollution of the planet Earth 
I, I, I looked at the companies who were doing most of the big polluting, and they were the fossil fuels and petrochemical companies, as, as you'd expect. And then I decided to look at their boards, and I found that their boards were 90% or more male. And I, I've often heard complaints by female scientists that the chemistry department is always run by funny daddy old male professors. <laughs> and so chemistry as a, as a scientific profession is dominated by male groupthink. You know, right, there are lots of young female chemists coming forward now, but they're not in the, in the upper echelons, you know. So, and then I started looking at who are the organizations around the world who are fighting chemical pollution? So you've got things like the American Breast Cancer Foundation, you've got the various environmental organizations and so on. Many of them were led by women. Many of them were led by women, you know, who are very concerned for the future of their kids, their families and things like that. And who realized, you know, that, that uh, the stuff you buy in the supermarket is a minefield of dangerous chemicals uh, and people just don't know it. Um, and, you know, they've got to make people aware. And there's lots of organizations like that like Healthy Child, Healthy Planet, around the world that are dishing out on the internet information for how to avoid the poisons. So it just, it, it struck me that the poisoning was all being done largely by males and the cleanup and the healthy message was being done largely by females. And I thought, well, that's an interesting, <laughs> an interesting divide. So maybe women are the right people to lead when you've got a planet that is so badly damaged as the one we've got now. Men will just want to mine more holes in it and spread more pollution. Women will want to clean it up because they're thinking about the next generation and the one after. So, you know, I mean, and then I started looking at the whole issue across the board, across all the, the industries and sciences, and I found exactly the same thing, that, that men are in charge of the, of, of the damage and the pollution and the war, and women tend to be in charge of the, the cleanup and the peacemaking and the, the healing and the nurturing and you know thinking about the future and i'm not saying that all men are stupid or anything like that by any means and there are many many men uh, you know including myself who, who, who share the view of women uh, but we need more men like that and we've got to get ourselves out of that caveman mentality basically mm. i couldn't agree more and thank you very much for saying it great <clears throat> okay thank you um so i'd like to go to peter mckinnon um John Schmidt, after Peter's uh, been able to uh, uh, complete his discussion, if you still think you want to make a uh, uh, a remark about CO2 and its half-life, uh, I'll go to you. So Peter McKinnon, please. Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Dave. And uh, Julian, uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation, one in which, unfortunately, I have to agree with your comments. <laughs> I mean, intent in the sense that things are not looking too good. Uh, so I just wanted to point out, if you're aware of a document that was recently released by the um, United Nations Office uh, for um, uh, Disaster Rest Risk Reduction, and the report uh, actually, uh, I first came across it through uh, Action Climate Action Australia. I provided the posting in the conversation. But the Climate Action Australia report is titled UN warns of total societal collapse due to breaching of planetary boundaries. Yeah. And the planetary boundaries that are talked about are actually nine. And I think you said you had 10. I don't know really you called them planetary boundaries, but I'm just wondering if you're familiar with that literature, because in fact, that planetary boundary work was first developed, I think, in Sweden in the early, you know, about 2014. Oh. Quite a few of the people who uh, who uh, developed that that diagram are my friends. So Emeritus Professor Will Steffen, Emeritus Professor Terry Hughes, they were partners with Johan Rockstrom in developing that paper, which they originally published in Nature in 2005. Um, they've updated it since then a couple of times, and they're still working on bits of it which science doesn't fully understand at the moment, like the chemical one. I mean, that, that diagram, in my view, doesn't do justice to the chemical threat because the chemical threat has never actually been measured scientifically. Unlike climate, which is being measured forwards, backwards and sideways, the chemical threat has not been measured scientifically. It's been a black spot, mainly because chemists have been responsible for, for perpetrating it. So, mm -hmm. you know, but now the, the, the tenth one that is not on that is misinformation. Misinformation is not a global boundary. 
but it's a terrible blind spot. If humans are misinformed or deluded or deceived about the danger of these threats, then the chances are we will do nothing about them because they will elect governments who do nothing about them, you know, or they will object to wearing masks or, or to whatever it is, you know, they, they will raise petty personal objections to saving the lives of their own grandchildren. So, you know, a, 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 an unintelligent, delusional human species is not going to save itself. It's, it's where our intelligence, so-called, actually works against us, reducing our chances of survival instead of increasing them. Now, um, so that is not taken into the, the, the Stockholm Group's um, group, yeah. Uh, because I, it, it's, you know, and, and things like the circular economy and things like that, I, I suppose they're implicit in that diagram, but, um, you know, they, they're not spelt out. So, but it's a very good way of understanding the finite limits of the planet, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I applaud it. But I prefer, and I've been advocating for, a human survival index, which is composed of all the, the things that you can see on that diagram, actually measured, but reduced to a single number, right? The Dow Jones mm -hmm. tells us whether the market is up or down. So it's a single number that tells us how well the stock market's doing today. Yeah. You know? Uh, the, the rainfall averages do the same with the, with, with the rainfall. You know, the, the DEFCON thing tells us how dangerous the world is for, from a defense perspective. The Richter scale. Well, the, tells the doomsday us, clock more than the DEFCON, but yes. So, so you, well, you, you've got lots of, you know, the doomsday clock is, you know, does, does climate and uh, environment. Nuclear weapons and uh, yeah, nuclear, AI. Nuclear weapons and, and climate, sorry. Uh, but nothing does all of them. And so I've got a proposal, and I'm looking for a group of academics to take this forward, um, a simple human survival index of a single number that goes up or down every day, depending on whether humans are more or less at risk. In other words, a measure of our failure or of our progress in solving the existential crisis. So this is one of the key proposals of the Council for the Human Future. But we're looking for a bunch of decent academics who could take on board the construction. I've been speaking to a number of people. I mean, for example, there is actually a chemical pollution index in the, in the process of being formed. IPCC can produce a climate index at the drop of a hat. Uh, you know, so, so there's lots, the, 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 the pieces of the machine are already there. But I want this to be something that you hear on the nightly news every single night. It's on your iPhone. It's on, it's on the news, it's on, on the internet, it's on social media every day. It's in your face. It's telling everybody, and bear in mind that we're all going to be on the internet before 2030. Right? There's currently 6 billion people on the internet. Right? We're, we're getting there. You know, by, by late 2020s, everybody's going to be on it. So we can tell everybody, hey, guys, we're in the shit. You know? <laughs> Time to start digging, you know? <laughs> Well, that's a bit speculative, but I do agree with you uh, again about the demise that uh, you described. So that's a, another common thing. And I'm interested in your measure, your um, uh, interest in a, in a metric uh, is, is fascinating. Perhaps we might communicate after. Uh, the second po point I wanted to make, and it was just a clarification, perhaps for those who were on the, um, on the listening to you, you mentioned uh, uh, at one point about CO2 residing in the atmosphere for 500 years, if it was released today. And of course, I agree with you, uh, but that I wanted to just point out that the amount of CO2, if it was released today, would be about 33% by 500 years from now. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just, look, I, I certainly skated over the detail. I mean, yeah, a, a lot of the CO2 gets taken up by the oceans very, very quickly. A lot of the CO2 gets taken up by forests and, and growing plants and so on fairly quickly. Um, but the residue is still active, warming the planet. Yes, you know, indeed it five, is. I, I mean, I've seen estimates between 300 and 1,000 years. I, I don't know which scientist is right. Um, but I, I say that to remind people that when they start their car or they turn on the electric light, you know, that they're having an impact, you know, 40 generations ahead. You know, they're, they're not just well, affecting... Well, the point you make about, and this is a very good point, that you you spoke about CO2 and therefore its implications to warming the climate still in 500 years. This is something that sort of misses most people because we concentrate on 2100. 
Yeah. And oh, well, indeed, uh, <laughs> without without uh, you know taking uh, gases, greenhouse gases, and the, we mentioned methane and also CO two out of the atmosphere, we'll never get to a point where we're for several hundred years of lowering sure. our temperature. So this is something that sort of is eclipsed by the nearness of twenty one hundred. Well, I mean, and all the short form, short term things in between. All things being equal, if, if if we hadn't done this with fossil fuels, we would be on the way to an ice age. I mean, that's a that's the natural cycle that we're in. It's going to take another few tens of thousands of years to arrive, but we're in a natural cooling phase, um, you know. And and so all we've done is actually defer the cooling phase. It, it does mean that there is latent cooling potential in the planet. Uh, if we can take our foot off the carbon accelerator, so so that 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 that's that that's the question: Can we take our foot off the carbon accelerator, particularly before the Earth stop starts releasing massive amounts of carbon on its own, which it is already doing? You know, I mean, as I say, the Canadian Arctic, you know, all those pingos that are blowing up, and Siberian Arctic and things like that, all the bubbles on the bottom of the the Laptev Sea, you know, there are some pretty, you know spine chilling things that are starting to happen around the world at the moment not to mention the huge forest fires and bushfires that are going on of course they're throwing up an awful lot of carbon as well well my last point uh, and that's as I, I make other interventions as we go is that i just made a, a point in uh, the chat about the number of nuclear weapons because you had mentioned that and actually under the start treaty which was renegotiated in 2021 and that's, of course, only Russia and the United States. The limit is 1,550 each. Uh, but the point is that uh, where you find the link here that, uh, that I posted, there are over 13,000 total nuclear weapons in the world today. Yeah. And uh, many of them, of course, are uh, just partially dismantled, but they're not destroyed. So they're, they're kind of in a storage shed. Yeah, that, that's right. I think I said that there's about 5,000 active nuclear weapons, ones that are ready to go at the moment out of the 13,000, which are in, in, in cold storage, as it were. Um, but that's more than enough. I mean, you only Way really more than need enough. As a matter of fact, um, uh, uh, Julian, uh, I'm one of the guys who was uh, behind the creation of nuclear winter. So I'm well aware of this issue of nuclear uh, you know, activity. We we were looking at the issue of what is the worst case scenario humans could do to the climate. Yeah. And of course, yeah. the nuclear winter ultimately became the result. Yeah. Well, it's still a nuclear winter is still a very much ignored threat. And people don't realize it starts off at a fairly low level. The amount of smoke and, and dust chucked mm -hmm. up by, by 50 or 100 tactical nukes uh, would, 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 would chill the planet. Right. I mean, the, the figure that I saw, um, Robock and Toon had a paper out, I don't know, about 18 months ago, um, which, which basically said you're going to chill the, the grain belts of Canada and the United States by about two degrees uh, on average, which means you're going to get more winter kill. Um, you're going to get harder frosts. Um, in Australia, we're going to lose four degrees of, of, of growing mm -hmm. temperature. And that could go on for a period of up to 10 years or 20 years. So that's going to hammer grain yields worldwide. It won't wipe out the crop probably, but it, it'll damage the yield. And that, of course, will drive the price sky high. Um, so, you know, it, 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 will, it will cause a huge hiccup in the world food supply if, uh, if there's a local nuclear war. Well, in fact, uh, yes, to support your local nuclear war, I agree. In fact, it was a paper published about eight years ago. Uh, in fact, Scientific American had a feature cover story on it. And it was, uh, in fact, a limited nuclear war between Pakistan and India, which yeah. have small nuclear weapons capacity in total numbers and in a size of explosives. Yeah. That would be sufficient to cause the kind of description that Julian was just describing. Yeah. So it, it's uh, it's very underrated um, and uh, hasn't had enough attention yet, but let's hope that uh, nuclear weapons continue to be reduced. Great. Um, before Thank we you. pass before we pass to John Smith, um, uh, Schmidt, sorry, um, two quick observations. One is that I think there was a slide that did include the boundaries. Um, but if I'm correct, Julian, your 10 mega risks, are 
not designed to be exactly meshing with those boundaries. It includes some other things as well. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. And the second thing is the great minds think alike because there's been discussion within KCOR about developing exactly the kind of index that you described. And I'm sure there is going to be opportunity for us to discuss that. So if you want to make a, a quick remark about uh, the boundaries and the risks, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll go to John Schmidt. Yeah, first of all, the, the boundaries reflect the scientifically measured physical boundaries of the planet. The threats that I'm talking about also include various things that are human and are not taken in there. So human population and, of course, misinformation and a delusional human population are major threats to our future existence. Um, and, you know, that's not encompassed in that diagram. These guys as a scientist and they're looking at it purely as as earth scientists not not as social scientists or, or things like that so i'm trying to incorporate the human behavior element there secondly i am very willing to share with you my proposal for a human survival index if you guys know the top academics that we can find worldwide to action this thing it would be a boon it would be a wonderful collaboration between CACOR and the council for the human future I'm very happy to uh, to do that because we, we want to get this information out there. As I say, I want it on the nightly news every damn night, you know, at that little number. Do you know, are we safer or are we more at risk? Right. Great. Okay. Uh, John Schmidt, I think you actually had a couple of different observations. Um, and after that, Jeff Strong. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, first, I just want to say that what draws me to Julian's work and his writings is his integrated approach. Um, he's a great synthesis. He, he doesn't just follow one line of thinking. He sees how all these things come together to, to create the situation he describes. Um, and and I, I think that's extremely important. I think the population mindset generally is, is a linear thinking and not seeing much more than what is immediately in front of our faces. I think that's one of our biggest problems. So trying to alert people to the combined effects of all these things um, and that one plus one plus one, et cetera, doesn't add up to uh, a straight uh, arithmetic um, uh, sum uh, is important. Uh, well, the point I made in, Peter mentioned the, the fact that CO2 has a half-life and, and according to the article he provided, it's about 10 to 20 years. Um, but there are consequences of putting it in the air with methane and the other um, uh, chemicals that Julian discusses. And, and Julian's already mentioned that the, the Arctic and, and Antarctic melting, um, which are, uh, and the permafrost melting, which are creating massive amounts of methane and other um, Gases going into the air, as well as as well as um, uh, biological things that we haven't faced for a long time, uh, and I and I think you know it's that it's that ongoing effect that secondary um, self propagating feedback and and enhancing loop. I think that's extremely important, that, and so we can't think about these things linearly um, um, and in a very short term. Um, the mindset thing in, in the other point, I think, is that we, our generation um, has grown to be a consumer generation. And those of you with gray beards uh, and mostly in North America might remember the Dow Chemical advertisement, uh, Better Living Through Chemistry, um, which was in the 60s or something like that. And that's what we've grown up with is that, you know, we can engineer um, our world, we can develop our world uh, to better serve our immediate uh, wishes, as you will. I was going to say needs, but it's not needs. And and that what we do is is we try to make ourselves more more comfortable and make things easier and stuff like that without thinking of the consequences. And and Julian's point about having an index or something which puts in front of us all the time. The consequences of what we're doing um, takes it takes it out of the beyond the blinkers that most people have. 
Um, so yeah, uh, I'll stop there. But but I, I think it's important to, to get that wider view and share it and share it and share it. And when we talk about governments, governments are political, okay? They don't think about what's best. They think about what's gonna get them elected. And Julian points out that each of us has a personal responsibility to take certain actions and actions that we can take um, in our purchasing power, et cetera. Uh, that, that, you know, the questions on the chat, how do we affect governments? How do we affect governments? Well, uh, we affect industry because government is driven greatly by big money industry. Um, so, you know, anyway, that's enough for me. Response, Julian? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I would observe that John has already acted preemptively and abandoned the Earth in, in favor of a Star Wars planet, I, I believe he's now living with, <laughs> now living with Luke Skywalker, <laughs> next door to Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Anyway, um, look, there, there, are, there are an awful lot of points there to really unfold. Um, politics, uh, we think that, we, we tend to think, we in democracies tend to think that the world thinks like us. It bloody well doesn't. Most of the world's governments are not democracies. They are self-appointed autocracies or dictatorships, okay? Most of the world. So, you know, six, seven billion people are living under autocracies. We have to reach those people as well as the ones who've got a vote. Right? Very few people have a vote on this planet, except, and this is the point, every single one of us votes every single day with the dollar that we spend on whatever it is. That dollar sends a signal to the market. Do we want sustainable food or unsustainable food? Do we want toxic clothing or do we want healthy clothing? You know, do we want um, clean energy or dirty energy? Uh, do we want renewable food or unsustainable food? You know, so if we can educate people to vote for those things with their wallet, we can control the mega corporations. And the mega corporations control the governments. So that's how you control governments. You know, it, it, it has to be done with your little vote, that dollar you spend. So people have to be educated what is good for their future and what is bad for their future. It's as simple as that. Great. Okay, so I'm going to go to Jeff Strong, followed by Ralph Martin. Yeah, Julian, one of the problems I find with your presentation today, and I came in late, but from what I heard, there's nothing for me to disagree with you. I agree with everything you've said pretty well, especially what you were saying about women in power, having raised three daughters and I have a feisty wife. I, I learned long ago that often when their argument seems wrong, they always turn out right because they're looking at it from a different perspective, from the good of the family and the good of the future and that we're men generally or not. But that brings me to my question, which I put in the chat, is that we know what needs to be done with the climate, just as you've outlined today. But how do you get the cooperation of all governments of so many political persuasions? In Canada, we can't even get our own government to drop fossil fuels in favor of renewables. And we've got supposedly a democratic government. How do you get, how are you going to get that cooperation? We've talked about it in, in, other, in other talks and that, and, but um, no answers for it. <laughs> well, I, the American, Australian and Canadian governments are particularly bad in that they don't govern for their people. They, they govern for the fossil fuel corporates. Yes, exactly. They are in the, they are in the in, in in the hip pocket of of, of those bloody companies who are you know who are out to wreck the planet basically or are too damn stupid to know what they're doing. Uh, although, but you know, the general yeah. public thinks otherwise. What you said is right. They're in the pocket of big corporations, but the, the only I mean the only way we, we we change this is by having a worldwide movement. Whether you go with Extinction Rebellion, which is the one, the movement that arose out of Britain, you know, which is concerned young people and they're on the streets and blocking that up the London <laughs> roads and things like getting arrested and flung in jail, just like in the Vietnam era. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, whether you're doing that, whether you're doing Greta Thunberg, you know, just small, effective communication activities around school strikes. Um, sooner or later, this message is going to disseminate that the thing that we have going for us is social media. 
because social media, much though you may despise parts of it, also contains really good stuff. You know, you can get access to any university in the world on social media. Um, you know, it, it, we are sharing human knowledge and human understanding at the speed of light for the first time in human history, the first time in a million years, we are now able to talk across the whole human species. And as I say, by 2030, everybody is gonna be on it, probably sooner. So the opportunity to share the problems, the solutions, the ideas, and the opportunities is getting bigger and bigger as we go. And I'm finding many groups, whether let's talk about regenerative farmers. Now regenerative farming is spreading around the, the planet at the speed of light, because farmers are sick of this industrialized agriculture that they've been forced into, you know, which is damaging their landscape, their, their animals, their crops, their, their, their farming future, their children's future themselves, it's wrecking their health. You know. So farmers are in revolt as well. It's a quiet revolt and they're being very cautious because they don't wanna lose their incomes, you know, but the supermarket chains have driven them to, to this form of resistance where they, so, but that is spreading on, via social media. Nobody's telling farmers to become regenerative. They can work it out for themselves. They're pretty bright, you know? And so that's an example of how solutions are disseminating around the planet via social media and the internet generally. So there are many, renewable energy is another example. It's not just being promoted by companies selling solar cells. It's being shared by people all over the place, you know. Oh, my village has just installed its own power unit and gone off the grid. You know, I mean, that's happening in communities all over Australia and Britain and probably Canada too, for all I know. Uh, you know, so, so these ideas catch on fast. There's lots of African communities that are going totally renewable without ever having gone through the fossil phase. You know, they're going from, from burning wood <laughs> to, to solar and wind. The biggest wind farm is in Africa today. You know, so, so, you know, there's all sorts of opportunities here, which, which I think is the positive message here. It makes it very exciting. And people's consumption patterns, their decisions when they spend their dollar are going to influence these big corporations because they're going to go broke. You know, so it's not just a matter of disinvesting in fossil fuels. It's a matter of saying, I'm not going to use your product, mate, because you're poisoning my kids. Uh, and, and many, many people around the world are, are reaching for that decision, especially the younger generations now. You know, and it, 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 it's, as I say, it's going at the speed of light. Our human minds are- Very, But we always have to bear in mind that uh, we don't have 20 years or even 10 years to win this revolution, but as long as I we keep that in mind. I understand that we probably won't get there without a lot of tears. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as I've said, to move some of these immovable objects like the, the fossil fuel sector and governments is going to take an absolute crisis. We ain't seen nothing like the climate crisis that we're going to see in five or 10 years time. You know, That's I mean, true. all this, this big hot summer that everybody's going on about, it's nothing, it's nothing. You know, and farmers cannot grow a crop of, of, of grain if they are hit by a flood, a drought, you know, and, and a heat wave. That grain just dies, you know, yeah. and, and that that's going to become a recurrent theme in world history. You know, that's going to hit the Ukraine. Why do you think Russia's in the Ukraine? Part of the reason Russia's in the Ukraine is that they can't rely on the Russian grain belt any longer. So, so they need the Ukraine grain belt to add to their uh, their, their their food security. So, it's, it's part of the motive, you know, for for Vladimir Putin wanting to emulate Peter the Great. Um, but and, and incidentally. It's the same motive that Hitler went into Russia in the first place. You know, the Germany's war aim was to secure the Soviet grain belt and feed Germany. Okay, that was the whole reason that Germany went to war in 1939. They had to go through Poland to get there, but that's the reason that they went. They went to war. So you know, th these these things really affect geopolitics in a big way. But I, you know, look, I, I agree we're running out of time. The quicker we act, the more lives we will save. The slower we act, the more humans we will kill. But it's, I, I, I just, you know, I can't put it any more strongly than that. But we share this information, share this knowledge with ourselves. You know, more people are going to act quicker and they're going to send their economic signals and their political signals. Great, thanks. Um, so I, I 
would like to ask your permission, Julian, to extend this slightly. We've gone about five or seven minutes over already, um, but I have uh, three or four people in line, and I, I'm um, very interested in the conversation that's going on. So if that's okay with you. Yes. Okay. Uh, so we're going to go to Ralph Martin, followed by John Hollins. Try to keep it short if you can, guys. Ralph, are you there? I couldn't find him on the list. He's probably logged off. Okay, he's probably logged off. We'll go to John Hollins, followed by Mr. Vance. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, may I show you a cartoon from the Globe and Mail, uh, Canada's leading paper uh, published in English. Today's cartoon uh, was this. Let me just put that up, if I may, for a second. Is it there? Yep. Okay. This is a picture of a race with two lanes. Uh, on horse, we have someone uh, riding for climate change. The other competitor is nuclear war. I thought this was an encouraging thing to have appear on an as an editorial cartoon. The, the cartoonist realizes there's more than one issue at stake here. And in a sense, uh, Julian Cribb, you've answered my question, which of those is at risk of winning the race. So let me turn that. How do I turn? No, 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 I want to share. I want to stop share. OK, um, thank you. Um, look, um, you've shown that it's a race of at least 10 lanes, not just two, which makes grist for a possible letter or piece to send to that newspaper. We'll see about that. KCOR is a modest non-governmental organization and I'm sure we all share your broad view. Um, we have been for almost 50 years a modest think tank seeking to share ideas, and we still are. Uh, incidentally, we have a sister organization called the Group of 78, whose business is to address the issue of, of nuclear war. Uh, but KCOR has just in recent times started to advocate. Um, and as you've already noticed, we have more white beards than women on this telephone, on this call. And that's true for all on all purposes. In your view, KCOR as a modest organization has to decide where it's going to put its effort for advocacy. Would you put effort primarily into trying to reach government or in trying to reach citizens and through them government? Thanks. I would certainly put the effort on the citizens because that's how you influence government. Uh, government will not do anything unless it's frightened it might lose government, uh, basically. So, so you know, they, they believe in the 51%. Um, so, so it is citizens, you know, this comes down to individual human beings making a decision about their own survival. In, in my forthcoming book, How to Fix a Broken Planet, in every chapter where I describe a problem, I describe what the solutions are at the global level. And I also describe what the solutions are at the personal level. So I say, well, you know, climate change, let's get rid of fossil fuels. Personally, this is here's a list of you know 200 things that you can do in your own life um, to reduce your climate footprint, starting with having no children. <laughs> um, so, so you know, basically, uh, we, we we have to recruit the bulk of the human kind for for this course. It's it's about all of our survival. I mean, this this affects peasant farmers in India, uh, you know, herders in Africa. Uh, people in Tierra del Fuego, it, it affects absolutely everybody. You know, it's not just us privileged, white bearded old farts, you know, it, it really, it really, um, we've, we've got to change it. Now, you can speak to government till you're blue in the face, but you will be checkmated by petrodollars and petrofascism, right? They, they, they will jerk the government's reins and say, you want your election funding or not? You want the job on the board of the coal company when you retire from politics? 
You know, you really, Mr. Mr. Prime Minister, that's where those guys are going. They've been bribed, they've been bought and sold in the marketplace. There's heaps of evidence of this. And look at the amount of money we pour out to subsidize that bloody industry every year. Hundreds of billions of dollars are paid by governments around the world to subsidize oil, coal, and gas. You know, it's a disgrace. It's a, it's a huge ripoff. Um, well, well, why do they need the subsidies? They're profitable enough as it is. You know, so, but, you know, the <laughs> so they in turn spend some of those billion dollars influencing the outcome of elections, right? So whether they do it directly or indirectly with, with their lie factories and things like that. So to be honest with you, although I do try to talk to governments and I'm trying to get a, a spot in my own federal parliament here to make, give the same talk, um, I, because I want, I want the newly elected independent members of parliament to think about this. I, I give up on the old ones, you know, the, the party, the party people, they're, they're completely bought and sold as far as I'm concerned. But to influence governments long-term, to influence the Chinese government, you know, you're going to have to talk to the people, Chinese people. And the Chinese, the Chinese government does listen to the Chinese people, believe it or not. You know, I've, I've spoken to the head of their statistics department who monitors public opinion very, very closely in China. And, and uh, he tells the Central Committee what the people are thinking and saying and where they've got to really pull their horns in. Uh, he warns them when the people are unsettled about this or that. For example, uh, he warned the Central Committee that people were unsettled. Uh, you may remember the melamine scandal when... when um, powdered milk was 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 poisoned and things like that and it sent huge scare through the mothers of china and that had immediate reverberations on the central committee so politics in china is actually not that different to politics in a democracy um it's just that they don't vote, really vote for it you know um so they they use different methods but public concern you know is top of head in china it probably even is in places like burma uh, and so on although they try to sit on it um so, in other words, public opinion can sway these things. And, and, and so I believe we share this. This is why I emphasize social media. We've got to get out on, and I'm seeing hundreds of people now. They, they're called doomists or doomsters or whatever, apocalyptimists. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm called, um, you know, on social media. But they're saying, look, if we don't do this, we are stuffed as a species or as a civilization. We've had it. Uh, I'm seeing more and more people saying that, some of them with good rational scientific reasons and other than, others than just emotional, you know, and I know humans have always predicted the end of the world, uh, but this is a different thing. The, in this case, the end of the world is actually scientifically attested if we don't do, change the trends that we see today. And I think people are capable of understanding that. Thank you very much for adding political science to your natural science talk. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Vance has uh, decided he will bow out. And um, Art Hunter, you're going to be next, followed by Gene Doherty. And uh, Gene, I think what should happen is when you uh, get to ask your question, have your little discussion, um, you can go right into the thank you. Julian, I'm, I was really delighted to hear you talk about human survival and talk about policy and, and, and an index, because uh, not many of our speakers think that way. And uh, although I am certainly one of them, and I believe very much in human survival at the community level. And um, of course, each community is unique and has its own pressures and interests and what have you. Um, I have given up hope on, on any, any global movements and, and anything that is, uh, uh, requires the UN. I mean, we take a look at the, the COP series and I mean, that whole uh, uh, process is, is run by the fossil fuel industry and, and nothing substantive ever comes out of it. And, and I expect that will go on until such time, of course, as natural forces take place. And we uh, uh, were already, you know, got our, our foot in the extinction event and, it, and it's deepening uh, as time goes by. Um, and uh, we, we will start seeing the body count 
going up as well as as uh, uh, massive capital losses and sea level rise and and uh, <clears throat> um, pandemics and 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 yes uh, starvation that that's that's clearly on the cards but we should I I maintain we should be in the mode of finding uh, ways to adapt to survive, at least for some of us. Um, we will not be able to save 8 billion people, but maybe maybe a billion or maybe 500 million. Uh, I mean, one can debate the numbers, and but uh, we don't seem to be moving in this direction. Do you know, has there been any studies that have been done that are looking at community survival as a way for, for some of humanity and the species um, to survive. I, I'm not aware of any. No, I'm not aware of, of any specific scientific studies like that. I mean, there's lots of small communities who are making the decision that they're, as I say, they're going to go off the grid. Uh, they're going to look after their own needs and things like that. Um, you know, Canada being a northern nation, is likely to be one of the last groups of humans left standing. Going to have to cope with an influx of about 200 million Americans, of course. But um, you know, uh, so it, it, this sort of stuff is pretty important. If, it, if 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 push comes to shove, the refugee wave on the planet is is just going to obliterate countries. All right, I'll give you some examples. Currently, one third of a billion people leave home and move to another country every year. Right, that's 80 million people are refugees and 250 million people are voluntary migrants who are moving from the pressure areas of the world to places like Canada, Australia, United States, Britain and so forth. So these are people who have seen, seen the disaster in their own country coming and they've got out ahead of it. Uh, and that, so that's a third of a billion. Now, the World Bank and others have predicted that up to a billion refugees and you know climate refugees and migrants will could it so think about the world what the world might look like if a billion people are on the loose looking for new homes you know there there is no military in the world that could cope with a flood of that nature you know or not without going nuclear anyway um, so you know that is going to transform the world as we see it is is vast numbers of people. I mean, if, if India falls over, India, Pakistan falls over because of the water crisis, you know, th there's probably going to be three, four, five hundred million people leaving that continent alone, you know, and heading everywhere. And they already are, you know, I mean, isn't the Prime Minister of Britain going to be an Indian? Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> they're already in situ. Um, so, so, you know, th th there's lots of this going on. And that's what we, that's what we fear. It, could I just share with the screen one more time? Um, I just want to. That's good. Yeah, I just want to put this up. This is my 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 forthcoming book, How to Fix a Broken Planet. The answer to a lot of these questions is actually in this book. This is an outline plan for how to save the human species. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's written simply because my target audience is 14 year olds, which means it's a bit too intelligent for politicians to understand, but I'm, I'm targeting the concerned young people of the world with this book, explaining the problems, telling them what the solutions are, both at planetary level and at, lo at your personal level, what you can do. And, and, and look, these are not my solutions. These are the solutions I have culled from the scientific literature. Okay, they're things that the scientists are actually recommending. So, um, you know, uh, hopefully that'll be out before the end of the year from Cambridge University Press, who did my last two books. Um, so, you know, uh, hopefully that this will start a conversation about how we address the total existential crisis that humans are facing. This is the worst crisis we've ever faced in a million years of history. OK, we're good at getting out of crises. We invented fire so that we wouldn't be eaten by leopards. You know, and, and things like that. So, so you know, we, we, we've dug our way out of, out of deep holes in the past. We're very good at survival. Hopefully this book, bringing together all that is known from the best of science, is a way of starting the conversation and getting people thinking about what they should be doing. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to make two really quick points. Uh, the first is that I've written a paper about how we might reform governance in um, uh, democracies that's on the KCOR website that uh, makes it unnecessary to have funding because it, do, it does away with elections. It still gets us people by essentially a jury selection system. It still gets us people going into a parliament, but it essentially does away with elections. And I, I would encourage you to, to uh, read it. I'll see if I can send you a link to it. The second one is that I know your book is, is a, um, based in science, as I would say my uh, uh, series is. It's two books now, The Odd One and The Rich One, also largely based in science, but I suspect it's going to show the right hand side, sorry, the left hand side as I saw of that globe with the um, remains of the fire. So you might be interested in it. Uh, okay, we're gonna go to, over to Jean now for uh, a question and then she can go right into the thank you once you've finished your conversation. Uh, mine was more of a, of a comment rather than a question. You were talking about trying to uh, figure out a way in which we could put in front of everybody every day a measure that is a number that tells you, you know, how well we're doing. The, the Club of Rome, along with uh, well, KCOR as uh, an association that belongs in, as part of it, as well as other national organizations, are in the throes of trying to develop just exactly what you're talking about, some way in which you can measure wellness that is not just about money. And so um, KCOR is involved in that, and uh, certainly we can put you in touch with some of the people that are working on some of those um, issues and trying to figure out some way in which we could measure things. Um, and um, on another topic, um, we also at, at KCOR um, developed what we call the Canadian Environmental or Climate, what is it, Canadian Climate Charter, Charter of Climate Rights and Responsibilities. And what we were saying was basically that governments have certain things that they need to do, but human beings or citizens also have a responsibility to go along with it. So it is another thing that we have we have done that is an attempt to try and get engagement with people and something that individuals can actually look at and see how they can deal with it, deal with it on a personal level. So those were just comments that I wanted to make. And, um, and it is as the chairman of KCOR, it is my pleasure and privilege to be able to thank you on behalf of the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome for an absolutely fabulous talk. Um, I had the, the opportunity to see your slides before the presentation. And as I told you, I was really looking forward to it and you did not disappoint. It was a wonderful presentation. It showed both the catastrophe that we're facing, but the potential solutions that we might see. So thank you very much for a fabulous, fabulous presentation. Thank you everybody, really appreciate it. And, and with that, um, I would also like to say that uh, on, if you are not a member of the of KCOR, I would strongly um, recommend that you go to the CanadianCore.com, which is our website. From there, if you look at the Stay Informed page and sign up for that, you will get the information about the link to today's talk when it goes up, as well as all the other talks that we have had at our KCOR Zoom series, as well as a few other things in the past. So you can look at all of the wonderful speakers that we've had, including Julian, and all the chats and all of the slides that people have had there. In addition, it will give you information on how to become a member if you're interested and all of the other things that we are able to do. So I strongly encourage anybody to go and take a look at our, our website at canadiancore.com. So with that, I would like to say thank you very much again for a wonderful presentation. And um, I just, I'm, I'm thrilled. Thank you.